Ever since it got here, the big boat has basically just been standing there, waiting for me to finally get started with the works on it. Truth be told, things did not go according to plan. I was faced with a series of misfortunes in my personal life, which led to a serious delay in my boat life. That's all I'm gonna say about this, because luckily, things got resolved, and I was finally able to have the time and peace of mind to attack this big project. So in today's video, I will be able to show you how we built a solid transom for two outboard motors and I'm also going to show you how we paint the entire boat in one fell swoop. You may remember that in a previous video I talked about installing an inboard motor with a stern drive. Well, in the meantime, I've moved away from this idea, mainly because of the numerous comments from our viewers advising against a stern drive and also based on my own judgement as to how much more difficult this installation would be compared to simply installing twin outboard motors. While I was thinking of what would be the best way to do this, I came up with different concepts, but in the end, with the advice from a good friend, I decided to simply build it as solid and simple as possible. The main structure will be composed out of four vertical beams. For this I'm using 100 by 100 mm H-beams. And in order to get an even surface where to attach them to, I'm gonna build a rectangular frame which I'm gonna weld onto the stern of the ship. So I got some fresh steel. as well as a new welder with all the necessary accessories to start welding more professionally. The gas I'm using is a mix of argon and carbon dioxide. Setting up the gas bottle is easier than it seems. I just watched a couple of YouTube tutorials and through those learned the principles and so I didn't have any issues whatsoever. Basically, you just need to make sure that all the connections are properly sealed and to always remember to close the gas bottle's main valve after you're done welding. Setting up the welder is even more simple. You just need to feed in the welding wire. Of course, you first need to make sure that the thickness of the welding wire corresponds to the nozzle in your handle, but other than that, there's very little you can do wrong. Once the welding wire is fed through, all we have to do is hook up the gas bottle and then we're ready to go. I'll turn the gas flow to about 10 liters per minute and then I'll do a first test. Since this is clearly working, next I'm gonna try to weld together two big pieces of steel. Looking at the result, and based on my previous welding experience, I could only conclude that magic was involved in whatever just happened here. Filled with confidence, I moved on to working on the actual pieces, first by making a solid rectangular frame for the future transom. To get a perfect 45 degree angle, I simply draw a perfect square, then draw a diagonal line through two opposing corners. To reduce the amount of cuts I need to make, the end of one piece is always the beginning of the next one. Once the four sides are cut, I just need to prepare the edges for welding. With the edges cut into a V-shape to leave space for the future weld, I align the pieces by using this perfectly level table. So here we go with the first welds on the actual pieces that I'm gonna build. My first results were not very satisfactory, so I'll jump right ahead to after I ground the ugly welds back down and cut a groove through the middle to place a new and hopefully better weld on top. To 
To avoid any further mistakes and time-consuming grinding of ugly welds, I'm going to do some tests on a piece of scrap metal so that I can improve my technique and find the right adjustments for the welder. Once I'm satisfied with the result and confident that I can put down a beautiful weld, I move back to the actual pieces. At this first try, I didn't really dare to make a continuous weld, so I cut it up into four segments, as you can see here. For this next weld, this time I'm confident that I can put down a continuous weld along the entire track. Through the darkened glass you can see clearly how the welding arc cuts deep into the material on both sides, leaving a solid weld in between them. And there you have it, the first weld I am actually proud to sign my name underneath. One could argue that it's a little bit too high, but I can adjust that by reducing the wire speed on the welder. Moving on to the next weld, you can see clearly how I'm moving the nozzle left to right in a slightly arced movement, literally stitching together the two pieces of metal. Notice the absence of any slag, which is a characteristic of the MIG welding technique. And here once again, a weld I don't mind showing, a little bit rough at the beginning, but very smooth at the end. As far as I can tell, these welds do not require any further treatment. Recently, my Victron Quattro broke down and I had to send it in for repair. In search for an intermediary solution, I found the Anchor Powerhouse 757, which, full disclosure, Anchor gave me for free in return for this segment. So here we go. With an output of up to 1500 watts, it can easily run my espresso machine, which is rated at 1350 watts. Of course, I can also run my microwave oven and even the fridge at the same time. Same goes for the shop vac. While quite heavy, it's portable enough that I can even use it out in the field. Here, by the way, I'm using one of those big angle grinders, which is rated at 2000 watts. Or I can power all my DJ equipment and sound system and all our laptops and phones at the same time. It can be charged by a regular wall socket or by solar. When I did my tests here, it was already close to sunset on an overall not very sunny day. That's why the input is so low. And that's my quick overview of the Anchor 757 powerhouse. For more information, check the link in the description. Now that my welding skills have improved to mere expert levels, I will move on to welding directly on the boat by closing up this little crack here. First I cut a rectangular hole, then I make a template of the hole. I draw the template onto a piece of 5mm thick sheet steel. I cut it out with my plasma cutter. With all humility, I admire the nice clean cut I just made. I grind the edges into a V-shape. I'm adding a piece of metal for the grounding clamp, which will also serve me conveniently as a handle to put the metal in place. Next I put down four beautiful wells, one on each side, to seal this hole once and for all. Finally, I add a layer of primer and with this the job is done. Next, let's move on to attaching the new steel frame onto the stern of the boat. My good old welder friend came by to help me and he brought along his dog. First we have to finish putting together the frame, which I kept in two pieces because otherwise it would be impossible to move it as a single person. 
Here you can see how a master welder closes off a relatively large gap. He places one bead at a time, each time remaining a little in the center to add sufficient material, closing the gap from both sides at the same time to prevent the material from getting too hot, which could cause the welding pool to drip down and thus create a hole. After cleaning up the newly built frame, my friend proceeds to welding two pieces of flat profile onto the stern to create a temporary support where the frame can later rest on. After making sure the frame sits dead center and under the watchful eyes of my friend's naughty dog, we proceed to welding the frame firmly onto the boat. First with a little point weld so we can do some more adjustments such as here. Next with some more sturdy welds to keep the frame firmly in place. My friend measures the distance between the frame and the hull in some places and then cuts a few steel bridges to weld the frame sturdily onto the hull. After preparing all the areas for welding, my friend welds in those bridges. At the same time, he's giving me instructions for changing the settings on the welder to achieve optimal performance. And so while my friend was busy welding all those little pieces, I started to prepare one of the supporting beams on the side, sometimes by using the angle grinder, sometimes by using my plasma cutter. My friend will then go ahead and weld this in place, and next we can start preparing the big H-beams, which I'm first gonna cut in half. After once more preparing the steel for welding, my friend would go ahead and weld the H-beams firmly in place, making sure to not overheat the steel in one area by switching from side to side and making relatively short beads. In the process of attaching these H-beams, we had to make sure that they were not only at the right distance from each other, but also perfectly parallel to each other. When welding the H-beams to the frame, my friend would sometimes place three successive beads on top of each other. This creates one massive weld, which provides greater stability. And with that, my monster transom is, I would say, 90% complete. If you enjoy what you're seeing and you wish to support me, you can do so in my Indiegogo campaign. Find the link in the description. Alright, now the rest of this video will be all about getting the boat ready for painting and then painting the boat. We'll start with the underside. Here, of course, we have a rich growth of our beloved barnacles mixed with algae. 
Luckily, they aren't very tough and quite easy to remove, so I tried first what I could do with this scraper tool and what it would be like if I used the angle grinder with a steel brush right away. Clearly, the angle grinder gives us a much better result, so that's the tool we're gonna use. A good friend proposed himself to deal with the underside so that I could focus on other things and it took him about 20 hours to clean the entire underside of the boat. Now before we continue, I must tell you my strategy for this paint job. Because of the size of this vessel and my very limited budget in terms of time and money, I will only remove the paint that comes off easily and leave anything that survives a run of the angle grinder in place. People suggested that I sandblast the entire hull, which I know would be ideal, but it's simply beyond anything that's possible for me right now. Okay then, now that this is clear, let's move on. For the sides, we need to take into consideration the different kind of conditions that we have. The bottom end is of course covered with barnacles and algae. In some areas the old paint is gone, but the steel underneath is like new. In other places the steel is totally rusted. And for the largest part, the old paint is completely intact. So once again, I'm checking which tool is best to deal with all those different areas and long story short, the angle grinder with a steel brush lets us obtain the best results. I even tried sandblasting. I got one of those mobile sandblasting devices together with a powerful new compressor To set it up, all you need to do is add the blasting material, in my case, basically just sand. Power on the compressor and we're ready to go. It turns out that my blasting material got a little moist over time, which is why the sand wouldn't come out properly here in the beginning. I then figured out that it would work if I would shake the container while blasting, so that's where I'm at right now with sand blasting. Now despite these issues, the results from sand blasting are really impressive. So is the mess it creates. Next we went ahead and ground down the entire sides of the boat. This was sometimes done by me, sometimes by another friend. I removed the old sacrificial anodes. Next we got some music, a little buffet and some rust converter. Some friends came over and with this we had all the ingredients needed for a boat painting party. With the rust converter applied, I got out the main paint, which is the kind of paint they use for shipping containers. And there she is, 
dressed in a beautiful 7038 grey. As far as I'm concerned, it's a glimmer of hope, a new bright spot to go against an overall darkening world. In conclusion of this video, I want you to know that the past few months were among the most challenging I have ever had the privilege of experiencing, and that it's only because of the help and support from family and friends and also you, the supporters of this channel, that I managed to push through. So at this point, a huge thanks to all of you. Without you, I am nothing, and without your help and support, I can't do anything.